we started off with a question about strawberries. Does anyone have ripe strawberries? And I was saying the early strawberries, yes. Like the June bears mostly are ripening pretty well despite the cool temperatures. Um, they are getting a little soggy sometimes though. And it's one really good reason to mulch your strawberries with like, um, I like the coarse wood chips myself, not bark, but the coarse wood chips because the air can pass through and it kind of keeps them off the ground and they, they are less apt to get rotten that way. Because when they sit on the ground, the heavy berries plunk down in the ground, that's when you'll find they start to get um, little rot spots on them. So keeping them above, or straw is what a lot of the um, field grown strawberries were grown on straw, right? That's why they're called strawberries. Um, so that's another good way to, um, you mulch with straw and that keeps them dry and beautiful. But we were also saying, you know, that the later bears are actually a little slow. So they're still maybe in the white stage or just small forming. Um, and then you'll find as they ripen up, that um, again, they need a little more warmth than they're getting at night these days. So sometimes they're kind of tending to be a little on the sour side, I found. What do you think, Laura? You said you've got berries, are yours sour? Sorry, um, you, you know, I just had, a, I just grabbed like five of them and they were, I mean, you know, most of them aren't ripe, but, but, but I like looked around and found some that were good and they were so good. I mean, they were just, just perfectly sweet and wonderful. Um, we, we just got a plot up at um, Wacky Neck in, mm. in their community gardens. And, and so they have a whole bunch of berries all set up. So I don't know what they are because they were, you know, there before I got there, but, but they're, they're really pretty and tasty. <laughs> well, one way to make sure that your strawberries taste good is to make sure that you put some compost mulch around the plants after the fruit are mm -hmm. um, done. Or you can do it earlier in the spring, but of course that happened then and this is now. So now you want to wait till the fruit is ripened and, and harvested and then mulch with compost. That enriches the soil and that helps the plants build what's called bricks or natural sugars. And it makes a lot of fruit taste and vegetables too, actually. Um, if you have turnips that taste like old sweat socks, if you put more <laughs> compost around them, that picks up the natural sugars, even in turnips and parsnips and things like that. And you'll find they have a much deeper, richer flavor. Um, but we also had a question, Anita was asking about Marshall strawberries. Um, and they were the berries that were grown here on the island, on Bainbridge Island, traditionally for about a hundred years. Very, very sweet and, and juicy, very difficult to ship because they're quite fragile and they only last a couple days. And they had been almost lost to commerce for a while. They were considered one of those um, lost foods, but in fact, they were still all over the place on Bainbridge, even though the strawberry fields disappeared many, many people had them in their gardens and at the historic museum. And they've been um, kind of resuscitated by some of the local farmers too, who are growing them. And I have quite a few. Um, in fact, there are some growing at uh, the senior center in the front bed along the street. Uh, yep. And of course they put out runners and make more. So I thought that would be a fun prop for us. Maybe Rita, you and I can start propagating some of those and hand them out to people as uh, door prizes for something, right? That'd be fun. We're also growing a new kind at the senior center called razzleberry, and they're supposed to taste more like raspberries than regular strawberries. So we shall see. They are not ripe yet, but they're coming along. So I was going to talk about tomatoes too, because <laughs> I've had so many questions about tomatoes. And let me just start off by saying that a La Nina cycle is not optimal for tomatoes. They really do not like cold, wet weather, and they do not like our cool nights. You know, it's been dipping down into the 40s again. And for tomatoes, that's just really not a good place. In fact, it stunts their growth, quite literally. Um, under about 50, you can't even start tomato seeds. Um, and the, the starts usually kind of flounder, as we've seen. Anything you planted earlier this year may not have done particularly well at all. Um, the other problem, of course, for tomatoes is that they do not like wet foliage. And with the current rainy, crazy situation, we have a lot of wet foliage and, and that's when you can get blights and all kinds of crazy disorders. Um, and even if you succeed in setting some fruit, there are a whole lot of problems associated with cold, cool weather, which we saw last year for sure, um, which like one thing is called cat facing. And you may have noticed on some of your tomatoes, almost like a ring with puckering in it, often around the blossom end, um, or various parts of it that looked almost like you'd tied a string around it and so it pooches out but has these ridges. Cat facing happens when it's cold and different parts of the plant 
are affected. And so they are actually stunted while the rest of it isn't. And it's like, you'll get that little pucker. Um, it's just a crazy thing, but it's not your fault. It's temperature related. Another cold temperature weird thing that can happen is called zippering. And you'll see it, as I've seen that a lot the last few years. Um, it looks like a stripe down the side that's, it almost looks like a zipper. And that's when the, the flower anther actually gets stuck. It's the pollen becomes so gummy in high humidity, it will stick to the fruit and then cause that, it's like a mechanical damage. It's not a, a disease process, but it will cause that stripe to continue as the, as the little fruit gets bigger and bigger, it will carry the scar all the way up. So again, that's not your fault. It's a, um, artifact of cold weather. We also, a lot of people have asked me why the foliage is purple on their plants. And that is another cold symptom. In cold weather, a lot of times, even if the soil has adequate nutrients, the plants really can't absorb them. They can't pick them up because their roots are kind of shocked by the cold. And so low, um, when low phosphorus, particularly in a, in a tomato plant, will create that purple color. And again, there may be phosphorus in the soil. You may have tried to uh, feed your tomato plants, but they can't take it up when their roots are not functioning properly. So it, you know, the best thing to do is actually protect them. Uh, somebody recently sent me great pictures of tomato cages or kind of like little huts that she makes with remage, remesh, which is that those big squares or, or rectangles of a uh, heavy duty wire mesh that is used for reinforcing concrete. It's pretty inexpensive. You see it at like, you know, Home Cheapo and places like that. Um, and you can actually set up panels of that, cover it with bubble wrap with the bubble bits on the inside, and you can make a top and sides and like roll back the bubbles wrap on the sides in the daytime and roll them back, but keep the top cover on or keep a piece, a sheet of, um, you wanted something translucent. So sometimes people have used old secondhand windows, double pane windows, or you know heavy duty plastic like you would use for a paint drop cloth um, and put that over the top and leave it there. And that helps the leaves stay dry, which will really reduce the amount of foliage disease you'll get in a rainy, wet, cool year like this one, which is perfect conditions for all kinds of diseases. <laughs> Laura. Yeah, um, I just water my garden plot, including my tomato. And I'm just sitting here thinking like, oh my God, I got it all wet. Um, that, that I should probably not do that in the future, huh? I should just get it on the ground. Yeah, you wanna water the roots and not the foliage, especially. Yeah. Now the good news sort of is that it's very windy. <laughs> okay. um, and it's good news and bad news, right? Because wind yeah. dries out the soil, wind dries out pollen too, um, okay. which can make it, less apt to, you know, it, when, when pollen is dry, it doesn't always stick to the, um, to the stigma very well. And so it, sometimes that means reduced pollination or, you know, less fruit set. So yeah, um, you really want to keep tomato and bean leaves also dry as possible because both of them are very susceptible to foliage diseases if the foliage goes into the night wet especially or in cool temperatures which is like all the time right yeah, yeah. so so, so I, I, after this call I'm going to run out there with a the microfiber and <laughs> dry it off I don't know. yeah you know you can make a little tent put an umbrella over it you got a big umbrella golf umbrella Perfect. we'll get one yeah I mean look for rotary rotary's coming up I bet you yep. can find golf umbrellas there. And some people use those on their peonies and stuff too, which is kind of fun. But yeah, you know, all the flowers that flop like crazy in the heavy rain, if, if you put a golf umbrella over them, they'll stay up. Um, it does look a little odd. I'll give you that. But they tend to have long, uh, you know, long handles. So you can, and Rita, you've got that cool one that actually has a handle that can screw into the ground, right? Yes, I do. I do. Yeah. I just pulled it out, but yeah, it's, it's great. That's the kind of thing that would help um, if you don't want to build a little tomato hut in your backyard. But I got to say, if you have the space for it, a little tomato hut will give you a lot more chance of having decent tomatoes in a cool wet year like this one. And this is kind of our third El 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 La Nina in a row. We're kind of stuck in the bot bottom of the oscillating cycle. So it, um, yeah, we're seeing a lot of issues like that. Uh, one, you know, and again, with tomatoes, you don't really want to feed them very much in 
cool wet weather because they can't take it in. So the best kinds of feed to give them would be compost and a liquid like, um, I like to use diluted liquid kelp, which helps them grow quickly and build, makes much sturdier cell walls. So they're more resistant to a lot of the foliage diseases that are so difficult at this time of year. Um, so liquid kelp mixed and then scatter a little humic acid around on the soil. And that will also help the, um, the roots access nutrients better. Humic acid is like the um, one of the essential ingredients from compost and it improves soil texture. It's not a fertilizer as such, but it really improves the exchange of nutrients for roots and it, it, and it um, improves the quality and tilth or what we call the hand of the soil. Um, so if that, and you can buy granulated humic acid, like a, you know, ACE <laughs> or any nursery, hopefully. Um, and that's a good way to um, help plants get a little bit better to start on a year when they're really challenged like this. Does that make sense? I, you know, one of the, um, somebody was asking whether tomatoes need bees to pollinate them. And technically they wouldn't because tomatoes are self-pollinating. But one of the things that can happen, especially um, in the humidity, if the pollen gets sticky, it doesn't shed as well, like I said earlier. So one of the things that bees will do is what's called buzz pollinating. Now, bump, honeybees don't do that. And so European honeybees are not, the best pollinators for quite a few things. But bumbles and some of our other native bees are buzz pollinators. And what that means, it's kind of cool. They actually grab hold of the plant, they grab onto the anther, and then they bite the petal. You know, bees have little teeth, right? And they grip, and then they start buzzing their wings at like 261.265 megahertz, which is middle C. That's the magic tone that causes pollen to release and shed. And so even though technically tomatoes don't need that in a difficult year, it really, really helps because as the pollen sheds, of course, the plant's going to get some of it's going to reach that, um, that little stigma that's waiting. Hello, I'm ready. And then the bee will pack up it's, we saw yesterday, my grandkids and I were watching the bees in the garden and they were like, wow, look how orange their legs are. And it's like their little pollen sacks were packed to the gills with pollen from, mostly from the cat mint, which they're all over this year. That's the blue flower that's blooming so abundantly in front of the senior center right now. Um, but what's sort of wonderful about bee teeth is it's the way that commercial tomato growers can tell if their tomatoes have been pollinated is they actually have like a, um, a magnifying glass thing that they use to see if there are tooth marks on the petals of the tomato flowers. And if there are, they've been pollinated by the bumbles, right? Isn't that awesome, cool? Because they're usually growing them in big tunnel houses and in greenhouses, right? Um, and they bring bumblebees in specifically to help pollinate uh, the crops in those indoor situations, which I think is fascinating. Um, somebody, my grandkids and I were talking about bee teeth earlier and looking them up and bees do have teeth, but they're not like ours and they're not like a crocodile's. They're on mandibles, which are kind of like an exterior jaw. So they have those little pieces sticking out like a, it looks like they're wearing a head mic with a vocal part right on both sides. And on the ends, there could be any number of little teeth and they might be round or pointy, sharp or dull. There might be just a handful or quite a lot because it depends what their chores are because they, they're actually born, baby bees are born with teeth on the end of their mandibles and that's how they chew out of the little capsule that they're in, right, as larvae. And then parent bees will come and bring the larva pollen uh, and other nutrients and they use their mandibles to offer it to the larva, right? And they also use it for chewing through wood, the carpenter bees, or carrying mud, the dauber bees, right? Um, and leaf cutter bees use their little teeth to cut those perfect circles out of your rose petal or your rose foliage, which I kind of love seeing that. And they use those circles to make wonderful, amazing little capsules to put their larva in. So they lay their eggs in these capsules that are lined with leaves and sealed with a perfect leafy circle. So if you're digging in your garden and you find this kind of leafy looking construct, it's a leaf cutter bee uh, nursery, essentially. How cool is that, right? I think bees are really interesting. Not everybody's 
totally out there with their magnifying glass looking at bees. But if you are, be really careful that if you're look at, using a magnifying glass to look at bees, that you're not focusing sun on them because that will actually burn them and can really harm them. So be on the other side from wherever the sun is coming from so that, does that make sense? So that you're not you, <laughs> using the magnifying glass as a little scorching tool for those poor bumbles. I we know. don't want to hurt our friends. No, no. But I love looking at the garden right now because there are so many kinds of bees. We were looking yesterday and noticing all the different patterns of stripes of, you know, the way their fur is uh, it banded or in big hole. Like there's some very black bees that are almost entirely black. Um, and those seem to love the lavender. They're all over the lavender. And that's a, a native bee species. Um, and I believe they're called black-headed bees. But <laughs> we saw so many kinds and I just thought how much more uh, lively that feels than earlier this spring when we saw so few bees. And in fact, we're seeing some of the problems with that now because many, many fruit trees are not fruiting. And some of the things that happened was, of course, it was so cold, there weren't a lot of bees. Um, and again, some fruit trees don't need a pollinator necessarily, but when it's really cold and wet, the pollen can mold. Or if it's too cold, pollen production just stops and it won't get renewed until the temperature rises up a little bit. Also, when it's very windy or very rainy, hello, um, the blossoms can be shattered before they get a chance to be pollinated. And so we see here on the island that I know someone with over 40 fruit trees who said she doesn't see any fruit on any of them. But Karen and I were talking the other day and she's like, Paul's bow, you had a little few more warm days than we did and more sun breaks and you actually got some, but less than usual, right? I don't know. It's the first year I've lived in Paul's bow. So oh, right. I, yeah, so this is the, so I, I don't know, but we had a lot of bees for the blueberries. They were just covered with them. It was yeah, wonderful. And, my blueberries and have you should see all the fruit. Yeah, we got lots yeah. of blueberries. So that was like oh, yeah. the right time of year and the right native bees were awake. Um, Cause those are pollinated mostly by a specific family of bees that like blueberries and huckleberries. And so, oh. and, you know, they're native, but they will go with the blueberries cause they're in the same family as the huckleberries, which is their native food. And they like those. So usually if there's huckleberries in your neighborhood you'll have really good blueberry set. Um, and that's been true this year. And they're a little more tolerant of cool weather than some of than the honeybees, for instance, which are not especially. But even the mason. Well, when we were on the, yeah, when we were on the second floor at a condo, uh, we did really bees on the blueberries. They were in pots. They still are in pots. But there were ants. Uh -huh. I think the ants pollinated. Oh, them. sure. Yeah. And there might have been hoverflies. Which are also quite yes. good pollinators. The little tiny, yeah, mm -hmm. tiny ones, yeah. I mean, that's the fun thing is like we think of the bee as the charismatic emblem of pollinating heaven, but actually, there's quite a lot of other creatures that will pollinate, including bats and mosquitoes, pollinate bog orchids, among other things. Um, bats organate, uh, will um, pollinate a lot of night blooming plants. So, like in the desert, you'll see them on the cactuses and things, um, but here. Mm -hmm. Some of the uh, some people who like to grow those big, beautiful um, uh, daturas, you know, the Jimson weed kind of family, the angel trumpets, those are pretty toxic. But bats pollinate those as well as night flying moths because they don't start being fragrant until late afternoon or evening, and then they put that fragrance out when their pollinators are starting to wake up and do their job, and um, so they're very night fragrant but not day fragrant. Kind of interesting, right? Like night blooming stuff like that too. Isn't that cool? Yes. <laughs> I love stuff like that. I know. So we're all uh, connected. You know, yeah. And we're not used to having to think about that. It's like when things go as normal, we tend to not really look at them very much or pay that much attention to them because, you know, you don't really have to. But once things start happening or not happening the way we're used to, then we're tending to look a little more closely and see, huh, why did that not happen? Or why did this extra thing happen or whatever? And, you know, that's where curiosity really helps us understand our, our inter, interrelatedness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're quite right. Yeah. So how, how's everybody's berries doing? Are, have you seen any raspberries yet, too? I know we have seen some strawberries, but how about raspberries? 
yeah, we've got lots of raspberries coming because um, again, they were later and maybe lower to the ground. I don't know, but the raspberries do seem to be doing okay. They're, they did flower uh, later than usual and they did get, they seem to have gotten pollinated, but they're quite small. And usually by now, berries on a raspberry would be pretty good size and they're not, they're tiny. Yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, one of my neighbors has an interesting thing. He um, has pears that have always been affected by scab and they he pollinates them by hand. So he got pears and they are forming. But what he did is he got a kale and clay powder mixture that's used a lot by the commercial farmers, uh, fruit farmers in Eastern Washington. And it's a, a compound that's sprayed onto the fruit and it, it, he said if, if it rains a lot, he has to reapply it, but it's been surprisingly sticky and it covers the fruit, but it doesn't prevent them from growing or ripening. And, but it keeps them from getting scarred or insect, uh, oh. bothered by insects or pests. So all those interesting things that can happen to our fruit might be prevented by this kale and spray. So it's an experiment. We're just, he's, this is the first year he's done it. But I thought, you know, our apples have always had these awful little nasty pests in them. Um, mm -hmm. They get the wire worm, or I mean, what do you call it? The apple maggot. And it's really hard to not have that. So I'm thinking, yeah. oh, this might be a good way to do it, to spray them with a the kale and mist a couple times in oh. the spring, right? That's interesting. Yeah, wow. I love stuff like that. Cause it's, you know, yeah. natural and neutral and not toxic in any way to anything. But it's right. a, it makes a physical barrier for uh, some of the diseases and some of the insect pests too. Wow, that is, I'm gonna have to check out the apples. I, I go over to, what is that garden that's off of, uh, oh, it's the uh, Parks and Rec garden. Mm. Like, help me out folks. What's the you mean the, the food farm? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah the forest, yeah. that yeah. one? Yeah. Right. Over, um, it's in Winslow, yeah. There, uh, oh, what's the name of that garden? It's, uh, I can't remember, but we always go over there and they have persimmons. I'm not and sure. I, oh, the Parks and Rec garden in, in Winslow? Yeah, it's the Parks and Rec. Do you remember, Laura? Do you remember the name? <laughs> well, I, I can't, but it's like on Parfit, right? It's, it's yeah, the Red Parfit. Fern. It's on Isn't Parfit. It in the Red oh. Fern garden? Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. now I see what you mean, yeah. Okay. And, and we went in there and looked at the apples and they always have little bugs and whatever. And yep. uh, yeah. But I still pick them and bring them home and make applesauce. So, <laughs> but, but they have lovely uh, persimmons there too. So if anybody wants some persimmons, you, you don't, uh, they have two, they have the Japanese and then they have the other one there. The Native so. American, that's from our, our American South. American um, South. And uh, they are wonderful. So just, just a the, heads up. In the South, they call them pawpaws. Pop -paw 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 picking up paw, paw put them in your pocket. Yeah, Way down pocket. yonder in the paw, <laughs> paw patch, right? It was a folk song. And yeah, I mean, and they <laughs> they have to be kind of grossly ripe to be edible. Absolutely, like water balloons. Yeah. Almost like. Right. And, and they are late in the fall, I yeah. believe. I and think because I use them to make a um, holiday pudding. Mm -hmm. I make a persimmon pudding, yep. which is a baked pudding, and um, and uh, it's, it, it, I know I'll I'll bring you some. You can all try <laughs> it because it, it's very tasty. And uh, but it's like yeah, because if you eat the persimmon too, if it's it, your mouth just goes like oh, like all the moisture. Yeah. yeah, it makes really puckery. It does a weird thing, which you should experience at least once. <laughs> it's like super lemon. <laughs> so the um, Japanese ones, you wait until they're really really bloated and then they cut the top off and eat it with a spoon oh, when they're delicious. really ripe and they're slushy kind of it's like a almost you know like applesauce it's almost mm -hmm. you know persimmon sauce right mm -hmm. oh, yeah it's a it's an acquired taste for some people but for cooking they're great they yeah. really are nice and even in the sour stage they give a really nice tang to um like a pudding or a you can make persimmon bread or something like that. Yeah. Right. I haven't looked to see, I'll go walk down there and see if they've set fruit this year. Because again, it really depends on what time of year the flowers came, whether they yeah. got fond of the bill or not. And that yeah. seems to also be like parts of, of the island got almost no pollination and other parts seem to do a little better. And we were saying Paulsbo 
because it's a bit protected by the curve of the land, um, Paulsbo tends to be a little bit warmer than Bainbridge yeah. and have a little bit uh, more sunbreak opportunities than we do too. So yeah, who knows? But that yeah, I walked over our neighborhood and they had uh, full-size strawberries that were ripe, a lot of them. And just right here in Paulsbo, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, you know, it's amazing the difference. Even at the senior center where there's that reflected heat yes. from the sidewalk and the heat, those, those strawberries are still kind of behind. They're not mm. big and full and ripe yet. So it's just that much colder. And this year, yeah. oh well. You know, and that's the other thing. People have said my beans all turned yellow. And yeah, it's <laughs> beans also don't like temperatures under 55. And again, it's been dipping into the 40s at night again. Um, beans don't like wet foliage. Oops, you know, so, but it's not too late. If you start beans indoors and get them going pretty good, then you can plant, transplant them out. Even now, you'll probably get a pretty decent crop. Um, just like start again, don't worry about it. Um, or get bean, pick up some starts at the nursery and put them out. Um, but because you definitely <laughs> didn't lose ground because the beans that have been in the ground aren't very happy for the most part. A few favored places seem to have, you know, protection from wind, which also really helps. You know, windy sites, and most of the island is pretty windy because, you know, especially around the coastal part, you know, the, the edges of the waterfront, and that's almost always windy there. If you notice at the senior center, there's always wind out in the front, right? Um, in my pea patch at Eagle Harbor Church, always windy, you know, so those areas, in, in one way, it's good because if the foliage is wet, the wind will help dry it off, but it also lowers the temperature and it can also strip moisture out of the soil where it belongs and make it harder for plants to even, I mean, it, people think I'm crazy because I'm saying you might want to water, but because that wind is whipping the moisture away and because even though it's been rainy, a lot of it's just drizzle. It doesn't really get down there. And we, uh, we have been, Washington is no longer in severe drought status, but it's still in drought status. Like, don't kid yourself. The ground, if you dig down, it's not wet all that deep, even now after all the rain we've had in the last few months. So if you're transplanting something, if you're putting in a new uh, shrub or tree or even perennials or annuals, you want to make sure you water them. And hanging baskets still need to be watered every single day. It's amazing how fast they can dry out if they just get an afternoon in the high 60s, which we've had a few of, boom, you know, you can lose that plant. So it's pretty hard to re-wet a hanging basket. <laughs> um, it's awkward. And a lot of them have too much peat in the mixtures and peat just sheds water. So once they're dry, it's really difficult. You have to actually, I used to keep a kitty wading pool and I would like take them, hang them down submerge them in the wading pool until they really got soaked and then hang them up again. But it, every time a plant dries out, it costs it something to come mm -hmm. back, right? So you never get back to where you were, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. It does. It does make sense. I had somebody gave us a, a hanging plant um, as a housewarming gift. And um, we we couldn't hang it, but I put it on a stand, and I I didn't water it for a couple of days, and it did not look good. Yeah, yeah. So it was, it, and it's un, it's it's under an overhang, so it doesn't get rain even. So it was like, oh man, trying to kill it. And I, so. <laughs> you, know, you got to remember, under the eaves is always quite dry. That's one of those uh -huh. places that's really hard for plants. Um, and also, no plant should really touch your house structure because that mm -hmm. is a recipe for well for one thing it makes ladders for ants and spiders and everything else to get into your house it creates a, a mold and mildew zone hey you guys can you work in the other room for a little bit thank you um it makes mold and mildew heaven along the edge where the plants intersect with your building right yeah. and you'll get you know that pollen build up really nasty on the edge of where, where the wood touches any kind of plants um, carpenter ants, termites, yeah, you don't really want that. So better to have this out. And under the deep eaves, that's almost always a very dry zone. So um, even in winter, things won't get water in, under there and won't get wet. Um, and that's something to remember. Like, I usually try to keep about an 18 inch no plant zone 
the, um, around the whole, any structure. And everything that's planted in a bed that's outside that zone should be planted in the middle of the bed, not the back. So that even in maturity, it's not gonna go past that zone. Because if you don't have that, and I put crushed rock or something or all around, and that's where you can stand if you have to power wash or paint, right? Or anything like that. Um, put the screens up, put the storm windows up, whatever. You wanna make sure that you can get at the building without um, wading through the plants, right? All right, yeah, makes sense. It does. And it's the voice of experience. <laughs> Does anybody have a question? Or? Yeah, that's what I was wondering. If any of the, um, Chris or Barbara, do you have questions you'd like to bring forward? Anita, do you have a question? I have a question. I was wondering, you were talking earlier about blueberries. Can, um, does, do people plant huckleberries as well? Oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. And you can buy, there's actually some huckle, native huckleberries that have been selected for their particular good looks. So you can get, um, I think, I think one's called Thunder Chief or something like that, that has dark stems and leaves. But yeah, any good nursery should have native huckleberries. And there are particularly productive forms that make good garden plants. And then of course, all the wildlife will love you. Um, Huckleberries are kind of a pain to pick because they're pretty small. But if you, um, I figured out a few years ago, if you like tie a, um, like a, I used a coffee tin with holes in it, the sides and put string around it and hung that over my shoulders. And then you can pick with both hands, which is what you kind of have to do. Cause otherwise you're trying to hold the bucket and pick stuff into it and they're little and they're falling all over the place and it's a big mess. So if you have a good picking bin in front of you that's hung on, you can pick right into it or pull a, a branch down and pick. And you have to kind of pick selectively over several days cause they ripen a little at a time. It's kind of annoying. And if you wait till they're all ripe, half of them are rotten. So you want to get in there <laughs> and pick a, every few days. And they do freeze beautifully, which is nice. Um, so you can pick a bunch, wash them quickly. Um, and then I put them in the spinner, like a salad spinner and spin them dry. Mm -hmm. And then uh, freeze them on a little rimmed baking sheet that I have that in a single layer. And then they'll freeze solid in just like an hour or something. And then you can just pour those into a bag or a box or um, little freezer container and they'll stay really perfect and nice. And they won't glop into a big blob. Those okay. are technical terms. Are they, are they ever sold like at a farmer's market that I could taste some? I've never eaten. seen them. Like I said, they're kind of a bear to um, pick. But if you go for a walk in the woods, or even I would think some of the Seattle parks, um, the, I would imagine that there would be huckleberries all over the place, really. Because okay. you know, they are native here and they are they come up spontaneously on Bainbridge in our gardens, um, bird sown, or because the roots have been here for a long time. Okay. Yeah. Well, I read that they are, um, they grow a little, they can tolerate shade better than blueberries. Oh, yeah. Yeah. If you see them in the woods, they're often on the edges of the woods, most often, or in the, in the lighter, where the, there's filtered shade. They like that. They don't usually fruit very well in deep shade, but they fruit beautifully in filtered shade. So they grow up in the winter, of course, in, with under deciduous trees like the vine maples, they would get plenty of light all winter. And when they can take that in, and then um, in the early spring when they're blooming, the you know the leaves aren't really out yet. But by the time that the berries are ripening, the leaves are make make filtered shade, and they do beautifully in that. So they don't need full. They don't do so well in full afternoon sun, but they like morning sun and filtered sun. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. They're Goldilocks plants. Yeah, they like the perfect condition. <laughs> Well, do I have to, I, I also read, you know, I was all excited because I garden with my little grandson who's three years old. So he loves to taste everything. And then I read that huckleberries are poisonous until they're ripe. Does, have any of you heard that? I have not, but that may be true. I do not know. Karen, you want to look it up really quick? Sure. That's, isn't oh. it amazing that now we have these phones I mean, not that we're not on our computers as well, but I, when I'm walking around with my grandkids, we look stuff up all the time. Like, what do bee teeth look like? We were doing that this morning, as a matter of fact, right? Um, looking at all the different, and how many blue bees are there? How many kinds of blue bees? Are there blue mason bees? Yes, there are, right? Did we really see a blue bee? Yeah. Um, 
it's fun. I mean, it's, but isn't it amazing that technology is in this state that we can have at least semi-decent answers to practically anything we can think of in a nanosecond? Yes, yes. I can remember when the internet was younger, looking up a particular plant and it had two citations. <laughs> and now if you look it up, it has like 200,000 citations. Yeah. Yes. But the, it's like just in the last 30, 40 years, it's just exploded into this amazing network of information, not all of which is accurate, let's just be clear. But, um, <laughs> but if you look on reputable sites, you will. And, you know, poison control is a good place to check for things like that. Sometimes it's folklore, but sometimes there's something to it. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of times immature fruit has higher, uh, you know, acids and things, and they, they sweeten as they ripen. So maybe it's something like that. I don't know. It says that they're, to they're slightly toxic before they're ripe. Okay, slightly. Okay. So I probably have to eat a lot of them. To really, yeah, be. And they're really small. You know, it's like poinsettias. People, you know, mm -hmm. freak out because poinsettias are toxic. Well, a toddler would have to eat two plants, yeah, to be in real trouble. And mm -hmm. you know, that's an unsupervised kid, if you ask me. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I'm very hungry. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah so be, be careful with them. Yes. Yeah, make sure they're right. But you can tell because they'll be fully red or fully black, depending on which type they are. And okay. it's pretty obvious that, you know, if you look at a, a, a twig that is, they usually come in clusters, quite, you know, dense. Mm -hmm. And you can see very clearly there's a range of color. And, you know, you can taste a couple to see which ones are the, were the right state of ripeness for you. Um, yeah, I'd have to be careful because he he um, likes strawberries. He knows if they're ripe or not. But, you know, just one side might be a little pink. And I'll say, oh, that's not ripe yet. And he'll say, oh, I'll, I'll eat it anyway. Yeah. <laughs> pop it in his like, like those, they eat raw, uh, unripe strawberries too. In fact, I kept saying, knock it off, you guys. Leave me some for later. But <laughs> it's yeah. a really good idea to teach little kids not to put anything in their mouth if they don't really know what it is. Um, to come and show you first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've worked, I've got that pretty much under yeah. too. That's important. Yeah. I remember when my eldest was very young, that he they were playing out in the backyard, a couple kids, and somebody said, Oh, can we eat this leaf? And <laughs> Lexi said, Well, let's compare it with something we know. Over here is this mint plant. If this is mint too, it will look like this and it will have a square. So this is a three year old, right? A geeky three year old. My <laughs> Um, I'll have a square stem because everything in the mint family has a square stem, right? And the kid is like, who are you? But, <laughs> but that's right. I mean, you know, if we teach kids interesting things and help them, you know, learn the world they're in, then it makes them safer, but it makes them more interested too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. I know. Yeah. Now so, we know about huckleberries. Thank you. Right? Thank you. That was a good question, Anita. I wasn't aware that they were mildly toxic. Um, right? So anybody else have a question or comment? Rita? No, my, the only thing is, my, I just checked my blueberries and they are, we do have a lot of blueberries and we've had quite a few bees I've noticed. And my son-in-law put up a Mason bee house with about, I don't know, 200 things. He's got a big one. Um, so we had lots of mason, we have lots of mason bees, and then we've got a lot of other um, bees that I've noticed too around on some different things. So I have one little strawberry, and they're tiny strawberries anyway. And as, and I mean, it's tiny, and I, I picked it up, I, and I turned it over, and something had eaten. Yeah, we saw so, that a lot yesterday that a lot of the young strawberries have been bitten by somebody. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just, my theory about strawberries and raspberries on this island, it are, it, this is it. We've had them in the garden just because we have, but you can go to the day road or any place soon <laughs> and get strawberries and you're supporting our local farmers and the same thing with raspberries. You can go the whole month of July just about to the farm thing on day road. You can get all the raspberries you want and you can support the farmers on the island. So that's my theory about it. <laughs> you are right. 
And the thing is, you know, it, you're it, even the ones at home that are getting chewed up by somebody are feeding somebody, right? Exactly. So consider right. it a wildlife sanctuary. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I do. I do. Yeah. yeah. You're not nice. to sign up wildlife sanctuary. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> I think that piece about knows. being have being in a reciprocal relationship with the natural world involves allowing our plants to get chewed up a little bit right. and not freaking out or spraying something because something has leaf, you know, somebody's chewed on the leaves a little here and there. Um, you know, it's true. Like I was kind of a shock to see that one of my beautiful kale plants was getting eaten and I, it was in a big pot with a deep rim and I picked it up and under the rim, there were huge snails this big. <laughs> they cut themselves under the rim in the daytime. So I took them off and put them someplace else. Actually, mm -hmm. I put them in the green waste. Oh, um, there you go. Travel there you on. Go. Eat that. <laughs> <laughs> but those snails aren't native. You know, we no. don't have native land snails up in this part of the world because we don't have enough calcium in the soil. And so all the snails that are the big ones that we see are, have come in on plants from usually California or other parts of the country. Um, our, the only native snails we have are aquatic. And so unless you have a stream running through and you're growing watercress in the stream, everybody that's eating, all the snails that are eating your plants are non-native. And so I figure mm -hmm. they can go in the green waste and there you go. Um, you're not upsetting what? the natural cycle that way. Our native slugs don't eat live foliage. They eat de dead and decaying foliage. So the European slugs that do eat live foliage are likewise not native. And so they are fair game. Um, I don't use slug baits anymore, but I have found that a big snail is and a slug are mutually adhesive. So you can pick up a snail by its little shell and then stick it on a couple slugs and they'll pick them up together and they'll stick together and then you can put that <laughs> in the green waste. And your parents don't get sticky. It's entertaining. Um, you know, you talk about being trying to maintain a balance with the natural world. Well, I think that ship has sailed, but we can still try to at right. least, you know, reciprocate and right. give back and it's like trying not to not like not using poison just makes so much sense in a thousand ways um, yeah. and just suffering a little loss like Rita said you know yeah suppose one year one of your crops fails because the rabbits ate it all well go to the farmer's market she's right right <laughs> um, or go yeah. to one of the farm stands along the island roads and yeah. support a local farmer and yeah I mean it's all good really yeah. uh, just you know, being willing to accept some imperfection, I think is a really important part of <laughs> maturing, but especially as a gardener, um, yeah. you know, recognizing that you're going to share. Somebody at the pea patch I work, I have my plants at, um, was giving me grief because I let some of the kale go to seed and flower and I cut it back so it keeps going to flower. And I was like, yeah, you guys have bees over here. Look where they are. They're in my pea patch digging on those flowers. <laughs> So you should say thank you because <laughs> I'm growing as much for the bees and the other pollinators as I am for myself. A girl can only eat so much kale, but bees can take an indefinite amount of, of nectar and pollen, right? And that's just, you're helping. And I think that's part of the beauty. Last year when I had sunflowers, uh, another pea patcher was very unhappy about that because she didn't like sunflowers. Um, and kept saying, when are you going to take those down? And I'd say, well, first of all, they're covered with bees, right? Covered with all kinds of pollinators. And then the seed ripens. And then now they're covered with, bee with birds. And they were picked clean. I had probably 20, 30 sunflowers in my little plot. And some of them quite big. And they were picked absolutely clean. So what's not to share about that? Like, it's beautiful to have birds in the garden. They eat insects, right? So uh, to me, it's like if you grow that way you think I'm doing this not just for myself but for the whole whoever else is around. I do make a mild exception for the rabbits. We have an explosion of rabbits. It's insane. Like until recent years I never saw a native rabbit here on the island. Never. The only rabbits we had it used to be the thing that you would do like if you had big bunnies and the kids went to college and you were stuck with these rabbits you'd take them up to battle point and dump them. And so there was bunnies of every color and size and description up there, big bunny families. You could see 50, 60 rabbits when you did your walk, right? And then there was a big boom coyote year and the rabbits kind of died back and it's been that kind of boom bust cycle for quite a while. Well then recently the coyotes have um, got that parva virus a few years ago and like dogs do and um, that kind of knocked them back and raccoons too had a viral issue. So we had low population of raccoons 
and coyotes. And then we had an explosion of these small native rabbits. Now, they must have been hopping across the Agapass Bridge at night. That's all I can tell you. Because we just didn't have that many rabbits, right? No. But now we have millions of rabbits. And literally, yeah, I mean, there's I a million in Paul's bone. <laughs> they we were see them all the time. All the time. And they're like, they were in the middle of my pea patch. When I pulled out a big kale plant, boop, two rabbits took off. I was like, sorry, dude, but no. Um, <laughs> it's crazy. Barbara, did you want to say something? Um, I have a question about Salvia. Sure. Uh, a couple of years ago, or last year, I can't remember when, I planted a bunch of Salvia plants with some lavender. And the lavender is beautiful with lots of bees, but the Salvia has not come back. Should I just wait? Well, it was those dips into the, the teens. Remember in February? Or maybe it was January. We had two or three real cold snaps in a row. And in my house, it got down to 17 at one point. And I know that it was even colder in some parts of the island. That is not salvia country. So a lot of the salvias are on the tender side. You know, they might take a few nights of freeze, but they wouldn't take a week of it. And when we had that snow and sleet and then everything froze up, yeah, no, forget it. Um, tender plants didn't make it back for the most part. And if they did, they're like teeny tiny sprouts that are thinking about it. Um, but it, I would say check the roots. If you have any life in the roots, you could wait, but you could also look around and choose um, a little bit tougher one because some of the salvias are a little more cold hardy and you can check with the nursery and ask them which ones were more successful last year because they they will know <laughs> what because <laughs> customers will come in and say, oh my God, I lost all my black and blue, you know, or whatever, right? Um, I find a good replacement for, cat, for salvias, which is cat mint which I was talking about yeah. earlier. And catmint, Nepeta, there are sizes, like Six Hills Giant is four feet tall. And then uh, Little Titch is like 10 inches tall. So there's a size for every garden and every place in the garden. And if you look at the senior center in that front bed, they're just blooming their hearts out right now. And the cool thing about them, it, they're these beautiful blue flowers, right? And as they begin to get spent and die back, I usually cut back the, the oldest flowers first, which is usually the outermost ones. So I'll cut like a third of the stems off all the way around the outs, the lower part of the, the ring. Does that make sense? And then those will start to, re and you, if you look, there's already gonna be new growth coming at the base of those spent yeah. plants. And then a week, couple weeks later, when the midsection starts to look ratty, I'll cut that out. And finally I'll cut the middle, or you can do half and half, but um, by cutting it in staggers, the new ones are gonna be coming on, be just about the time that the oldest ones are dying off. Does that make sense? Browning off. And that way you keep the flowers coming and it will literally still be blooming in October, November most years. Um, so that's really reliable. And again, look for the different, the size that's best for the garden space you have. Um, but boy, they are pollinator pals to, you know, and they're not cat nip. It's they're in the same family, but they're a little different. Um, and they're much more floriferous uh, than cat nip. But, and because they're in that mint family, they'll have the square stems and they are just bud builders. So they just keep on, keep on. They're great. Thank you. And also thank you for the talk about the wildlife because uh, we have all these deer coming through and we feel like they come over to our yard for dessert. <laughs> <laughs> we just have yeah. to get to it. <laughs> they probably do. And the thing is certain things like roses, you know, if you're going to grow them, grow a whole, whole lot and grow some of the taller ones so that, you know, they'll, I had a friend who used to do this. She had a big place and she grew a lot of um, beautiful roses, but she lined the outside of the garden roses with what she called her Kmart specials. And she would buy like the $1.99 roses with, that had lost their labels and all that kind of stuff and put all those on the outside. And she said, the deer eat those. I don't care. And then they don't, bother to go further in and they don't eat my beautiful ones in the middle. I thought that was pretty clever, yeah. but it takes a lot of space. Otherwise you're going to eat, you know, win some, lose some. Usually like a climbing rose, if you have space to put a tall rose up, they might come and graze on the bottom, but they're never going to get to the top. And you can kind of cage the bottom um, as it's young so that you make sure that it gets a chance to grow up. Um, but once they get established, they take off and then nobody can eat the whole thing, right? <laughs> 
I mean, that's part of it. It's like, if we're willing to share, we have to think about, well, what does that look like? I may not be able to do exactly what I did, you know, for 40 years in this other garden because things are different here or things are different now. So get flexible and think about, well, what could I do in that space? That might be just as joyful and beautiful, but maybe not so frustrating. Because <laughs> we don't need to set ourselves up for more frustration, right? The world is hard oh. enough. Yeah, for sure. Thanks, Barbara. Thanks. Yeah. I, you know, being gardeners, I think you have to have a sense of humor and you have to have patience. And you have to be willing to, uh, to, be, to lose some. And I think that's one thing I used to tell people a lot is like, when plants die in your garden, don't take the tag away too quick. Because one of the things I used to, I noticed in my earlier years was like, once I started leaving the tags, I'd be like, oh, this would be a perfect spot for Oh, maybe not because there's two tags there and no plant, <laughs> right? <laughs> like maybe that seemed like a perfect spot, but clearly it was not. So let's try something else. I was at a garden recently <laughs> where these dear people and they showed me this little pile of sticks and said, well, this rhododendron is the third rhododendron we planted here. And I was like, okay, that's not actually still a rhododendron. That is a former rhododendron. <laughs> and at this point, I would say that the message for you from that pile of sticks is that this is not a place for a rhododendron. <laughs> if you want one here, then I'd suggest you get a really big container, like a little trough, big, you yeah. know, and put your rhodi in that. And you probably have a decent chance, but in this particular site and setting, the soil is not appropriate and you're not going to get what you want. And you're going to spend less on the trough than you are on three more rhododendrons, right? Right. So, you know, get flexible. That's what I would say. Do what the yes. land wants us to do. <laughs> I mean, I, I think of our gardening as experimental and as a learning garden because I'm new to vegetable gardening. I have lots of house plants or, or I had lots of ornamentals, but I never did much vegetable gardening. So I'm learning along with my three-year-old grandson. So it's a learning garden for both of us. Well, and it's quite a different type of gardening. It's been interesting. I also, um, you know, if you've done both, you realize that like most perennials and trees and shrubs and ornamental grasses, ornamental plants for the most part, once they get established, they're much less work, honestly. Mm -hmm. But most vegetable crops are annuals, not all, or they're annuals in this climate. And annuals, because they just have a very brief life cycle, if they get a check or they're you know stalled out, they don't always recover. They don't come back as well. And so they have one chance. And so they, you really have to be on it. It's like we were saying with the hanging baskets, you gotta make sure they have moisture. You gotta make sure that they are fertilized pretty often. If it's in a pot, like I was saying, that's a good thing. Remember that as pots get watered, nutrients get flush. Now mm -hmm. in the ground, they're reserved much better than in potting soil in a pot. So if you're growing stuff in a pot and you're watering as you should be, um, you're also leaching out nutrients pretty fast. So compost mulch will help, but also that's where you would probably want to use like a good Dr. Earth uh, fertilizer and a mild one. You don't want the 20-20-20 stuff because that is like steroids. That Yes, if you had a hanging basket, sure, 20-20-20, keep it going. But for some vegetables in the garden, more like even under 10-10-10, you know, there's like a five, seven, five or something like that. That's a, a good balance. And you don't want to pump it too high because then you get lots of leafy growth and not much of a crop, right? You, and what you want is um, good steady growth and good, rich, well-nourished soil so that the plants can build that bricks I was talking about earlier, that natural sweetness, um, which affects all flavors. It doesn't come out meaning that your cucumber will taste sweet, but it means that all the natural flavors will be more fully developed in a plant that has adequate humus in the soil. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. So annuals are more like, uh, think of them as, you know, toddlers. <laughs> they need a lot, they need frequent feeding and they need to have their needs met really quickly. Right? Yeah, absolutely, so. <laughs> well, Anne, it looks like our time's up already. Well, thanks so, for coming up.